On tonight's episode of The Finish Line, it's myself and Richmond Webb, the dynamic duo, as we are going live for all y'all. And tonight we're talking about, did Mike Gusecki throw shade to his way? We'll also talk about Tua's off-season workout as some footage has come out. Also, I will tell you why Colin Coward is not right when he said 2024 is Tua Tagovailoa's last chance with Miami. Stefan Diggs is turning on to on Bills fans, and it's absolutely magnificent to watch. Man, we got a ton to talk about. So, as always, let's get into it. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you are new. <laughs> Huddle up, huddle up. We're gonna crank these engines up on one, on one. All right. Wait, Eddie. What is it? Drivers, start your engines. <laughs> This is the finish line. I approached a great offensive line in the past. Larry Little, Dwight Stevenson, Jim Langer, all Hall of Famers, and Richmond Webb belongs in that same group. Here are your hosts, legendary Miami Dolphins left tackle Richmond Webb, Reason, and Mr. Ballgame. What is good, Fin Nation? What's good? It's your boy, Reason. And we are back here for another one as for the second time in the past three weeks, it's the dynamic duo as ball game flops like a pair of sandals on a beach. And here we are. It's just me and you. But I want to start off and I want to say shout out to Polly King. Shout out to his mother. We're praying for her. She had her cancer surgery this morning. So we are wishing her a quick and speedy recovery. And Polly King, hope everything goes well for her during the recovery process and i hope it's easy on you and the family because i know how stressful that kind of thing can be i mean you know i didn't really talk about it last week but my my i mean i told you richmond and i told ball game but uh oh sorry martin i apologize the man coming for ball game seat um I, <laughs> uh, I told y'all that my daughter had surgery last thursday like you know ear and, and throat uh little operations and man even though it took like a little over an hour. Oh my God. Just, you know, my wife, eh? The doctor calls to tell my wife that it's over and it's successful. Bro, the look on her face. There ain't no thumbs up, no smile, no everything went well while she's on the phone. Just this look on her face yeah. of like stern and listening. And I'm like, she gets on the phone. I'm like, yo, I'm about to have a heart attack here. You need to tell me what <laughs> happened. Like, you know, just a thumbs up when the doctor calls is all I need. My Lord. Anyways, I mean, you've been there, right? You're, you're a, father a few times over right so, yes yes oh, yes no. I, uh, look at this guy can't respond to a text message but he can <laughs> up, okay? look at this guy can't respond to a yeah. text message when i ask for an update but he shows up and says well he can't replace me hey oh yeah ball game priorities huh anyway, he, on, he gotta be on he gotta he gotta be on his way uh 
Yeah, definitely, Pauly King, man. Um, we definitely praying for you. You know, I tell people you only get you know one mother, this and that, and you know you got to cherish that. But you know, anytime you got a loved one that that has a health challenge, or even like Reason said with his daughter, you know, I my my youngest, she tore ACL, and she had to go through that and and the long rehab press process and all that. So, um, you know, surgery. I, I I mean, you try to relax and you believe everything is going to be okay, but when they go under the anesthesia and stuff like that, you still got to wake up let them wake up recover and all that bit but I, I feel your reason when you said you know your wife could just say hey you know a thumbs up anything to show but you know women no. they they so attached to those babies man they they want to see them smiling with you know it ain't all right until they just make sure it's like they gonna what you say this and that bit uh yeah hopefully hopefully ball game uh gets the opportunity to jump on with us I miss him and all I know he's been tired with training and stuff like that, but uh, uh, yeah, he met, you know, he we met, talked about that. He ended, up, he ended up messaging me, he said, uh, his phone died earlier, so he couldn't hit me up, but he, he wasn't, he didn't leave till like 20 minutes ago. So if okay. he can, if he, okay. you know, okay. if he can, if he, gets, if he gets home in time, he can hop in on whatever, we'll be going for a little bit, right? So yeah, we'll be, we'll be rolling, so there ain't no thing, just hop on, it'll be, it'll be good to see his face and. And uh, see what's been going on with him and his family, but uh, yeah, excited to do the show. And I, I shared with you last week, and I'm share with the uh, with the with Finside family. Uh, last week, right before the show, we me and, me and Reason was talking, and the Dolphins asked me to announce a second round pick for the Dolphins, so I get an opportunity to go to the draft, have that experience again, get to hang out with the fans. So I'm definitely looking forward. I'll be in Detroit. So if y'all see me, holler at me. Don't be don't be trying to big time me like reason and ball game. Oh, yeah, y'all, yeah, yeah. Y'all some love. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be you'll be announcing the 55th overall pick, right? Unless they trade back or whatever. Unless they did what they did when I went to Nashville and, and me and Drake announced the uh third round pick, which was uh Michael Dieter. Mm-hmm. I, and when he, when he told me that last time, guys, I said to him, I said, hopefully this one works out better than Michael Dieter did. That's all I got to say. Hey, how did it feel to stand up there with Kenyon? How did it feel to stand up there with Kenyon Drake, an Alabama guy, bro? Come on, you're a Texas A&M guy. Blood must have been no, you know, he was, No, you know, it was actually cool because, you know, I remember the, the Miami Miracle play. It happened that season. I think the yeah. season before that. And uh, I met him and... Uh, once, you know, I kind of got kicked from the second round. Uh, they came and told me, they said, well, do you want to do it with Kenyon Drake? I said, well, ask him because he's really supposed to do it. But he was like, no, no, we can do it together. So he was cool. And then I remember we went back to the hotel and me and my wife, and I think he was on there with either, he was on there with a young lady. He looked kind of young, so I don't know if he's married or not. But uh, uh, when he got off the elevator, I told my wife, I said, you know who that is? She said, no, I said, that's, that's the Miami Miracle guy. She was like, why didn't you tell me? I could have took a picture with him and all that. Man. We we had a we had a real good time, so it, it was pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it. How, are you down there for the full three days? I will go Wednesday. Um, I think they have a lunch, and I'm gonna attend that Thursday morning. Mm-hmm. And then uh, normally the night of the first round, uh, that'll be for the families. We, I won't be over there that night, but wherever the hotel they normally have, where they have hors d'oeuvres, food and stuff, and um, if it's a local player, uh, former players association chapter, those guys come out. So you get to network with them. And then Friday, I'll go over and do that. And then Saturday, when they fly out. So Wednesday, have been, and then Friday. Have you been on the fish tank with OJ and them? I have. I have, but I didn't do it. I did it via phone. Okay. So I didn't do it like live because I'm here in Houston. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. I've been in the tank. It's, it was a couple years ago. It's been a minute. Yeah. Okay, I'm just because I'm just you know like I'm like I'm just shocked that the Dolphins haven't made more of a push. I know they leave it to like guys like Armando Salguero and stuff like that for the Hall of Fame, but I'm just surprised they haven't made more of a push. You know what I mean? Given you know what Shula said about you, what multiple Hall of Famers already that have played for the Dolphins have said about you and such too. So I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Um, let's uh let's hop into this. Let's let's start it off. And let's start off with Colin Coward and what he said regarding Tua Tongvaloa, and we'll give our thoughts on that, and we'll go from there. 
So if you haven't seen it, because this is kind of listen, we'll, we'll let me play the clip, and then we'll talk about it. All right. So this is what Colin Coward said on his podcast with his co-host. I don't even know his co-host's name. So here we go. Can I give you a theory I had on what the Dolphins should do? After what just happened? So the Bills, who I, I've said the overreaction that they're just going to suck, which th- maybe they take a huge step back, but they but they'll still be fine. Yeah, by league. far have the best quarterback, who to me is the second best quarterback in the league, and clearly one of the great quarterbacks we've seen in recent memory, talent wise. Yeah. yeah, the Dolphins have a big question mark with their quarterback, who's turned out to be solid, but in the biggest moments these last couple of years has crumbled like a cookie. Yeah, and this year I remember talking to Veach and Andy at the combine, and they said, and Veach specifically said, when you walked out on that playoff game, he's like, that's the coldest thing I've ever encountered. I was even nervous <laughs> just for my own guys, even though I knew we had homes for them, but I was like, God, and it wasn't even close. And they, they had no shot, the Dolphins. So now, yeah. before you give a guy a couple hundred million dollars, yeah. wouldn't you go, no excuses now. Belichick's with his kid in Seattle. You got, who knows what New England's doing. The, the Jets, I mean, are three pulled hamstrings and Achilles from being everyone getting fired. <laughs> and the Bills lost a lot of talent. So they just yes. have, if we can't do it this year, I mean, we just had, it felt like a 20 game lead halfway through the season. And then somehow we didn't win the division and they did. If we can't win it this year, we can't pay this guy. And then that means a home playoff game. We should win a playoff game. Wouldn't you just play this year out? You're already under the cap. Like he's already, his money's his I, money this year. I, Why pay him this year? Let's, let's kind of do a prove it year, a little Flacco style hey, almost. Dak and Tua, in my opinion will be available on the market potentially next year. I, 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 there's no doubt in my mind. I, mean, I would not pay Tua right now, given everything that just happened no, with the AFC. I wouldn't pay back. If you start I, don't, I a, think they're hesitant to do that, clearly. Yeah, yeah so I think I think Tua, I think Tua is going to be on the market next year. By the way, there's going to be a Kirk Cousins-level guy in the market, one minimum, two probably, for the rest of the years we do this for a living because – it's pretty clear in the NFL now. Two quarterbacks get you to a Super Bowl. A superstar, there's six, you know, Stafford, Allen, whoever, Mahomes, or a really talented young guy on a rookie contract. That's it. Yeah. That's the only yeah. thing that gets in. So good guys getting paid handsomely, Kirk Cousins, Dak, Tua, you can't pay Tua. So I think no. Tua will be on the market, and there'll be a team that's like, listen, we're stacked everywhere else, or – competency gets rewarded. Kirk Cousins has made more money than Tom Brady playing quarterback. Competency plus, and that's what Dak and Kirk are. Competency plus gets paid in every business. Um, What's, what, what are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on that? So his, you know, the, he's basically implying that both Dak and two are going to be on the market. This is basically what he's implying is this is, you know, off of what his co-host said, they're implying that, if Tua doesn't win this year, given the circumstances of the AFC East doesn't at least win the division, this is Tua's last chance with the Miami Dolphins. I'll let you give your thoughts on it, and then I'll go off of what you have to say. Yeah, I just I was just jotting down different things him and his co-host were saying. And um he said question mark, and I'm like, okay. Um, did he not have some good playoff games? Okay, I'll give that. But there are other factors that contributed to the Dolphins just not playing well. And that's why I hate the narrative, and I've said it on this show, I hate the narrative when it's Mahomes versus Tua or Josh Allen versus an NFL team is comprised of an offense and a defense. And and, and don't get me wrong, the, the quarterback is one of the most important, it's one of the toughest positions to play. So I give them a little credit. But – if I remember right, we lost three of our side pass rushers in that game. I think uh, X. I don't. I don't think X played in that game. Um, our offensive line. Um, Connor Williams wasn't there. This and that. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of injuries. So yeah, it was cold. To, you know, whatever. Bit. Um, you know, I think one of the things that Colin them got. They've got to figure out, do you want to be a DM? you want to be a TV analyst? And I guess the thing I have sometimes with Colin is he seems to really pick on certain teams or certain players. Like, it seems like if he doesn't like you or he doesn't favor you, he really 
um, goes in on you and this and that. And then I think they mentioned there was a few quarterbacks that can get you to the Super Bowl. And they mentioned Allen, but Allen hadn't been to a Super Bowl, I don't believe, unless I no. missed a year or two. Uh, so I'm like, I'm not saying Josh Allen is not a good quarterback, but it's just amazing how you spin the narrative, you know, and, you know, one minute we're doing good, this and that, everybody. And I think everything they bring up, I think the Dolphins know it. Um, to say you're not going to pay a player this and that, and even in Dak's situation, I think the reason he didn't get paid is because they just got cap issues. So I don't think it wasn't that they didn't want to pay him. I just think they couldn't, you know, as far as trying to fit everything up under the cap. They got Michael Parsons coming up. They got C.D. Lamb. They got some issues with, you know, that they got to, you know, restructure that. So it probably won't happen. I don't have no issue with that, but it's just – Man, it's a lot to pack, and you would swear these guys has built three or four teams for different organizations, and they've taken teams to the Super Bowl, but they just give their opinion, but they give their opinion as if they know for sure what they're talking about, and people sit there and listen to them. And I, I, just, it up. I just shake the head. But it's just too many factors to, to, to bring into something to just, you know, do that. And, yeah, I just trash – but uh, <laughs> I'll let you give your I'll let you give your spin on this. Is so I'm like, come on, bro. The reason why I think this is even a moot point that he's discussing here, they're in contract negotiations with him right now. What is that? First of all, let's start off there. What does that tell you? They're willing to extend him. They're talking numbers. They want him here for more than just this year. That's number one. Number two, Greer, under two different regimes, has seen. What this offense looks like without Tua Tungvaloa. I always go back to this. You're talking about a guy with a 65% career winning percentage. He's only played one playoff game in his career so far. Okay. You got to not only replace the guy who led the league in passing yards last year. <clears throat> you got to got to replace his 65% winning percentage. There's only like a handful of guys who have a winning percentage of, of around 65% or higher. And... So let so th that's another point I gotta I gotta take on there that just doesn't make any sense, and the whole conversation about his last chance to win. Listen, you know I, especially if they lock him up. If they lock him up, it's Greer and McDaniel could be gone if they don't win before Tua. I mean that's just a fact with the way this is all setting up, and you know to me. Colin Coward out here talking about, you know, uh, you know, I listen to these people and every, I've never seen a guy who led the league in passing yards and people in the media be so dismissive of it. Like if that was Jalen Hurts or if that was Jordan Love or if that was Justin Herbert who had led the league in passing yards, we wouldn't hear the end of it or Trevor Lawrence. We would not hear the end of it. It's like, it's the one, you know, everyone will be out here and say quarterback's the most position, important position on the football field, or as Ballgame says, it's also, going back to the injuries you talked about, the most dependent position on the football field. But then no one gives the flowers for, like, I, I, you know, what's shocking to me, and I've talked in private conversations about this, I just can't get over how dismissive, especially some people in this fan base are, of a league leader in passing yards being a Miami Dolphin. That hasn't happened since Marino. Just like this was our first Pro Bowl quarterback since 1995. I was 10 years old when we had our last Pro Bowl quarterback. And that's not that's thrown to the side. I, I've never seen, because before we got to a, you had a fan base and a media that was so desperate for us to have a guy who would accomplish those exact same things. Now, obviously... Do I do I did they let me down in the playoffs last year? Yeah, I expected at least a win. I expected more. 110%. They did not live up to expectations. I get that. But the things that he's doing and he and he's getting better every year. I mean, think about this. Everyone wanted him to stay healthy. That was what all these people were saying. He's got to stay healthy. He's got to stay healthy. So then he stays healthy. He leads the league in passing. Now it's like, well, you stayed healthy. That's great. Now you didn't win a playoff game, so you're just not good enough. But that wasn't heading into that last season. That was not 
your bar, your bar was he had to stay healthy and show you he could play a full season. He did that and he led the league in passing. Then all you did was move the bar when he succeeded your expectations. And you waited till December and January to move the bar. All y'all weren't saying y'all were putting durability way over a playoff win. All right. I remember the same people who mocked the jujitsu saying, Oh, this ain't gonna help him. It's the same people who are saying that him going with a quarterback coach saying that this isn't going to help him. They don't realize he's had a quarterback coach since 2000 and, since 2021 with Wes Carroll of quarterback prep. They don't even know he had a former quarterback coach and he'd been, he had been working with one. And now that he's working with the cream of the crop, none of them want to talk about it. Or none of them actually – some of these people actually don't know how – the elite of the elite when it comes to quarterback coaches are going to change and develop his game. That's how dense these people are, right? So, you know, to me, this is just such a... The fact that they're having the conversation of looking to extend him, this is not Tua Tagovailoa's last chance with the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, <laughs> they, 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 they'll always put the carrot in front of the horse and they'll never let, let him get to it. And it's just... Like you said, and, and I remember that when you just said it, the main thing was can he stay healthy for a whole year? And, you know, he worked on it and he proved that. But every time he puts on, he's got to – they got to add something else. It's, it's never it's never going to be good enough. Um, if he wins the Super Bowl, they'll say, well, no, he's got to win too. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be something else. They just keep – people are never going to be satisfied. And I, I think that's why – um, if you watch him, he's to me, he's really mature, and I don't think he he listens to a lot of the naysayers. He knows what he had to work on, and I'm like, if you're working with a quarterback coach, that means you're really trying to get better. I mean, it's not a requirement that you have to hire a coach to help you in the offseason. That's something that you're doing, taking initiative on your own. And like you say, he's been doing that. So he's working to continue to get better. That's just – the type of player, the professionalism in him as a player to continue to work to get better this and that bit. A lot of people don't see that. It's just I don't I don't I don't understand it either, but yeah, it's um well, it's crazy, man. People are not gonna like get, the, they're not gonna be satisfied. It's just not it's it's like the narrative he can't win big games. He can win big games. The problem is he doesn't win enough of them. That's the problem. He can win yeah. big games, okay? Yeah. Like let's let's start it off just this year alone. All right. The Chargers. I remember how many people were hyped for that matchup. I remember what everyone viewed. The Chargers were coming off a playoff berth. The Chargers had a top five pass defense the year before. They were getting guys like, um, you know, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa and Derwin James are fully healthy now. Right. I remember Tua. We had no run game and our defense was leaking. And Tua stepped up and he beat that team in L.A. You can't tell me the Dallas Cowboys game on Christmas wasn't a big game. Everyone knew how big it was. That was to win, win, beat the number one team in the NFC East, and you clinch what? A playoff spot. We clinch a playoff yeah. spot with that win, right? So that's technically yeah. a big game. And Okay, I'll go even further back. Germany, it wasn't, you know, two on the last drive. Did he do enough to win? No, but we shouldn't even have been in that position. Tyreek Hill alone cost us that game, not Tua Tungvaloa. Tyreek Hill in the first half between his drop at the 30-yard line at the KC 30, which we got no points off that drive, and then his fumble at the 31 that they ended up taking back for a touchdown. The guy alone, him alone, was a 10-point to 21-point swing, basically. That's basically what he was. So... Yeah, and then, I mean, you know, Buffalo. Remember the year before where everyone said Tua couldn't play in the cold weather? You remember that? And it was yeah. snowing and everyone was worried. Tua was one of our best players on the field. What happened? Josh Boyer let us down on third and what was that? Third and 15 or third and 17 before the end of the yeah. half. And then they ended up converting and scoring. But also, remember the a couple drives before that, Trent Sherfield and Tyree Kill, funny enough, his name pops up again, dropped touchdown easy touchdowns in the end zone where if they would have well, either one of those guys catch those football, we win that game. So again, who yeah. didn't let us down. So you know that, that, yes, uh, he doesn't win the big games. He doesn't win enough of the big games, but to say Tua can't perform or doesn't win games in general is too much of a blanket statement. And it's not true. 
and, and I was thinking about, you know, the, the charge thing was a good game you brought up. And I think the thing sometimes people just look at a win or a loss. They don't look at the factors that go into it. And we could have easily lost that game. But as an offense, we put up enough points on the road. That was a road game. And it's always tougher playing on the road to win it. But like you said, the defense, they kind of got it together late. I mean, we couldn't stop them, but we scored enough points. If you look at it, because I think it was 30-some points we scored that game. You figure you score that with the defense we had, you should win that game. But if we lose that game, they would say, oh, you know, Herbert beat Tua and, and this and yeah. that. And then it just it spirals out of control. But yeah, and, and they don't, let me they don't break let me, it down. And let me continue with, on with this because I see this. Man, he'll be balling. You can't look at. See, people want to make excuses for Tyree Kill. The same excuses they make that they say we make for Tua Tungvaloa. They don't hold. See, they that right there proves how people in this fan base hold certain players more accountable than others. Let me run down a list about Tyree Kill's key drops. Buffalo, December 2022, which I just mentioned. He makes that touchdown grab. We win that game in Buffalo. Philadelphia, October 2023, walk-in touchdown, which he dropped, and it would have tied the game at 17-17. KC, November 2023, fumble at the 31, which led to a touchdown for KC, and a drop at the KC 30, which led to no points on the drop in the first, in the first half alone. Dallas. 80-plus yard touchdown. Thank God Waddle bailed him out on the next play, right? Baltimore, back at the end zone, bobbled and dropped the touchdown. Buffalo, January 2023, third and seven, down 21-14, fourth quarter. Drops a, drops a wide open pass, and we have to punt. So, yeah, I ho guess what? Here's the thing is, when you watch me after Tua has a bad game, I hold Tua accountable. When you watch me after a game where McDaniel isn't in his bag and is terrible, I call out McDaniel. When Tyreek Hill costs us, I call out Tyreek Hill. I keep an objective across the board because, listen, well, to, you know, you can't hold, you can't blame drops on Tyreek because he's balling. Okay, he led the league in receiving yards, right? Okay. Well, Tua led the league in passing yards, and y'all holding him more accountable than you hold Tyreek's key drops. Make that one make sense. Make that one make sense to me. So that's where that's what see. There's no objectivity. There's nothing but subjectivity. People find certain players they hone in on. Look at me. Everyone knows I was not a fan of Jerome Baker while he was here, but I always gave Jerome Baker his flowers when he made a good play or when he looked like he was improving each year. Always gave him his flowers. Wasn't a fan of him. Always believed he was a wide nine will linebacker, off ball blitzing linebacker. Always believed that. He was out of his out of his place here, but I still gave him his flowers because you know why I can keep it objective. So yeah, it, it, and and to kind of just bring everything in, I, I just want everybody to know you're not like just picking on players. I mean, Tyreek is one of the one of the best receivers in the game, but I think the point is is that we all make mistakes. It's whether you yeah. focus on in life or whatever. But when you hold one guy, when when the measure stick is different, I, I think that's that's what's bringing up, and, and you bringing up valid points. But yeah, just nobody play. I, I didn't play a perfect game. You're gonna miss a block. You're gonna do this. You're gonna do that. But the effort and and you work hard and you just bust ass and the, the best you can. You're gonna win more than you lose, which you should. But yeah, yeah the the measure stick has got to be the same, and, and I agree with that. One hundred and ten percent. All right, let's keep it rolling. Um, because we know he said he'd keep it private, but I'm going to not play the audio because we're going to get uh, copyrighted on it. Um, okay, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> here's uh, Tua Tungvaloa. Shout out to the homie Bobby Bobby Shouse. He dropped this video. You can see, look at Tua, his release point. If you look at Tua's release point, it's higher. Right, look at his release point, it's higher over him, right? And it looks like you know, he it's much more tight and compact, and his release looks quicker overall. So, um, putting in the work, man, it's putting in the work so much. People were out here putting up clips and trying to play Sherlock Holmes and comparing it to this clip from a couple of years ago, where you know, his release point and how quick and how quick his release was, and where his you know, front arm was, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. People just out here, you know, you know, we're in the offseason when people start analyzing 
you know, training clips. All I will sit here and say is his release point looks higher. <laughs> his front, especially his front arm, looks a lot tighter coming across, and his release just looks overall quicker. That's what it looks like from the, the – if people want to hear what my thoughts on it. I'm not going to sit here and break down a 16-second clip like some people are out here doing. I'm just telling you all what I saw. Um, but, again, you know, if any, I'll tell all of you all, I'll be, again, objective with it. If all Dolphin fans haven't learned with Jakeem Grant that training camp videos only mean so much, I don't know what to tell you, all right? Wait till we see it on the field. That's what I'll say. But, it, you know, he's putting in the work, man, you know? And like I said to my Patreons in the last three take video, you know, I don't get the lack of coverage on him working with Tom House and John Beck and 3D QB, man. 26 of the 32 NFL starters, you know, work with 3D QB. And, you know, you Google Tom Brady and Tom House, or you do Google Drew Brees and Tom House, and you see either articles from Massachusetts or Louisiana about it, plus other, you know, external media outlets talking about it too. I just, you know, everyone wanted to talk about jujitsu last year and being durable. Well, now everyone is talking about the contract extension and they want Tua to win a game and Tua is doing everything in his power to get better. Hell, if you see his body, he even looks like he, sh you know, he shed some pounds and he's trying to get that mobility back because remember he was a pretty good athlete, you know, in college, remember coming out, he was actually listed as a dual yeah. threat quarterback. I don't know if you remember that. So yeah, he was. Yeah, man. So and I mean, you remember? I mean, you saw him when you watched your Texas A and M's. You know your Aggies play the, uh, the the Tide, right? You you saw what kind of athlete he was. So he put some, you know he put some pain on us. I remember. I ain't forgot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, listen. You know, hey, all I gotta say is this, right? We chose Culpepper over Drew Brees because of what our doctor said about his shoulder. Drew Brees went to Tom House, worked on his mechanics, and with basically a pop gun arm, lasted till almost 40 because his mechanics were so good and so tight. You know, I try to tell people all this time, Richmond, you've been around them. Mobility in the legs will go. Natural arm strength will go. But your mechanics... That's something you can always control until you exit the league. And mechanics yeah. are going to get the most juice out of your arms, the most juice out of your footwork, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, uh, that's that's how the greats have lasted until 40 nowadays, right? So just saying. And and be with a good organization, a good coach, you know, Ed Payton, Sean Payton yeah. for the last half of it. That, that definitely helps being in a good organization. And yep. uh, Brown, yeah, yeah, you you hit it on the head. That's it. So let's stick with Tua. I want to get your thoughts on this. I've already given my thoughts. Um, you know, on uh, X, I'll reiterate after you give your thoughts. Did Mike okay. Gesicki throw shade at Tua Tungabaloa? Tight end Gisecki? Mike Gesicki has caught passes from his fair share of quarterbacks over his six year career, including five over the last few seasons, but the newly signed Bengals tight end already feels something different about quarterback Joe Burrow saying this week that he's quote, never been in the huddle with that kind of talent. End quote. Is that, I mean, I know that shade at Zappy and Mac Jones. I mean, you don't got to tell me that, you know, I know that shade that way, but we're, you know, like, remember we're talking about a guy who, can't you know he can only throw a block on Twitter? He can't throw a block on the gridiron. You know, he goes to run an out route and ends up looking like a sideways horseshoe. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, and yet Tua, his best career numbers were in 2021 when Fitzpatrick was gone. It was Tua's team, and Tua utilized him when all the guys started falling around him like flies. Do you view that as shade thrown as my by Mike Gesecki into his direction, or more so? towards his recent destination of New England. Yeah, I'd probably say his recent de destination, you know, uh, I never met, you know, Mike Osecki, but I could just, in my heart of hearts, I think he really wanted to stay here and then to New England. And, you know, things just didn't work out. But when you go to New England and then it's just, you know, the situation with Mac Jones and this thing's come out of, and now 
it, it's almost like you get a second life because you say, okay, I was with Miami. They kind of on the upswing, this and that. Well, also the Eagles, you know, with Joe Barrow, they got a good, they got a good team, and you know, they went to the Super Bowl a few years ago. So they got a good young head coach, this and that. So it's almost like somebody breathed life back into you and say, hey, well, you know, I got a chance, and maybe with with the Bengals, maybe they're not asking him to be a blocker. Maybe they just say we'll just spread you out and let you you know, kind of work in the slide or something like that. So, uh, of course, he's going to praise his new quarterback because when you're a free agent coming in, the first thing they're going to start asking you is, you know, what about Joe Barrow? This, I mean, that's the guy in Cincinnati. And uh, he's had some injuries, but, you know, he's played really well for the Bengals as well. So I didn't expect him to say anything, else, but if he was taking a shot, I would think it would be more at, you know, from leaving New England and – versus going all the way back to Miami. But yeah, he was he was gonna hype up Joe Burrow or anything. And I, I think Joe Joe Burrow is one of the good young guns in the game right now. So he just said the right thing to kind of win the media over and 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 get him to you know jump on his side. I, I think he's just playing doing doing what he's doing. He's politicking. So yeah. Politics as usual. Wow, I agree. Listen, <laughs> listen, I said earlier today. You know, I don't really care what Mike Gusecki says or thinks, you know, like he's been gone or whatever. I addressed it, but I still said I don't care what he thinks. And I, you know, I stick by that. I really don't care what he thinks or what he has to say. Not a fan of the player. I thought he was more worried about, you know, running through garages and ca and catching footballs thrown over houses than he was perfecting his craft. You know what I mean? Never showed a willingness to block. You know, I mean, listen, what did I say when we got him, right? You know, we had John Embry in the building, right? We had Frank Smith in the building. Got You know, Frank Smith known for converting Darren Waller to a tight end. John Embry has worked with some of the great tight ends over the last 20 years, all the way from Tony Gonzalez, you know, to Jordan Cameron, you know, to, um, you know, all the way to George Kittle, right? He, he's got a list of like eight tight ends, <clears throat> excuse me, eight great tight ends that he's worked with over like the last 20 years. If they were going to move off of Gusecki, that basically told you everything you needed to know about where they thought Gusecki's future was as an in, as a tight end, you know, in the NFL and with the Miami Dolphins. I mean, those guys, you know, have literally turned receivers to tight ends. You know what I mean? So, I mean, the writing was on the wall for me with, with Gusecki. You know, listen, he can go worry about his frost tips and his boat parties somewhere <laughs> else now. You know, and when, and when Joe Burrow... <laughs> sees his lack of willingness to play physical, his lack of separation, his lack of good route running, and Gesicki once again falls on his face and doesn't get the targets, it ain't going to be Joe Burrow's fault because Joe Burrow's one of the, you know, everyone knows I'm a huge Joe Burrow guy. So he's one of the one of the greats in the game right now. So um, listen, and even Joe Burrow, listen, we don't know what he's going to be like. Second major injury since he entered the league, right? He's missed more games than Tua. You're right, hey. and, and, and you're right. He he gonna have to strap it up in in Cincinnati because you're right. Baltimore is physical. Uh, yeah, Steelers, you know. Mm. So it's you can't. Cleveland's yeah, defense can't the last couple of years. Yeah. Oh yeah, Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland had one of the best top defenses. So yeah. Yeah. You you every week you don't get no easy. You are gonna have to block or whatever because if not, you know, they're gonna yeah. be looking at you. They yeah yeah. You're right. You, yeah yeah. You, you brought up yeah. a good point there. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a physical comfort. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good luck, Mike Gusecki. I get in a you know in a physical <laughs> conference. Stay low, baby. Stay low. Stay low. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, uh, Richmond, but it goes from bad to worse for the Buffalo Bills and Stefan Diggs. I don't know if you saw this. Uh oh. Everyone made a big deal about one of his recent likes. One of his recent likes on Twitter. Quote, Bills low key got the worst fan base. Y'all bitter as fuck in the comments. <laughs> Oh man, what's worse? This or what Willis McGahee threw Buffalo under the bus, called the women ugly, and said there's nothing to do in Buffalo. I don't know which one's worse. <laughs> oh my god. Oh boy, I love losing Super Bowls, huh? You you, you, you do gotta remember now, uh McGahee did go to school at the University of Miami. So if you compare Miami to Buffalo, I, you know, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you ever hear what I say. I, I think it's the armpit of North America. So, you know, I mean, that's just how I feel. 
no. <laughs> oh, no. Hey. Oh, man. <laughs> Bill's uh -oh. Mafia in the house. Uh-oh. 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 Is put that it him? Into, put it into existence, and he comes. Is that him? There he is. Mr. Travis. There he goes. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Got a nice little tan. Look at it. Look at you, coach. Let's see you. What's up, my brothers? What's, What's up, my brothers? What's, What's up, my brothers? What's going on? Voice that went down a few we won, bro. That's what's up, kids man. and all that. What's my, up? What's up? My my dog. <laughs> hey, my dogs. My dogs went out there and dominated again today, and we won. That's what's up. Congratulations. From the bottom to the top. That's what we did. Three years it took us to get here, but we swept. All the big dogs, not even close, man. My kids did an amazing job. I appreciate y'all rolling me, riding with me, man, and let me have this experience with my kids, man, because you know how big I am about pouring into this next generation. But, man, they went out and phenomenally, bro, kicked butt, bro, like this whole, whole season. Um, it's We shift into Monday. We got the cluster, but for the most part, man, we handled business within our cluster, beat all of the teams that we had to run against, seven other schools, Watched them, and um, we're looking forward to try to go to district and, and do the same, man. And then maybe I'll take a couple to go to state too. But um, mm. they did a phenomenal job. I appreciate y'all, man, being patient with me. And to all of the, um, the you know, to all the fans out there, that um, I'm sorry I was gone, but you know, saying ball games heart is sometimes too big, man. I just, just can't tell the kids no. So when I when I committed to um, becoming their coach. I take everything I do in the life serious, you know what I mean? And um, like I said, pointing to these kids, man, I'm, I'm in my purpose, man. It's God working through me, man, to change their lives. And, um, yeah, it's just been a phenomenal, phenomenal journey, man, that this group um, reached their goals. And um, it's it, – yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy right now, bro. But I heard what y'all was talking about, man. I hate to just jump in, man, but I, this, this Colin Cowherd thing got me – Got me. Well, he got me. He got me hot, bro. Because come on, I just, come on, give it to me, us. Yeah. Come on, I let think, it get it off your chest. Yeah, I'm buttoning your shirt. I think at some point, I think at some point, man. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I yeah. I think at some point, man. When you think out, about, bro. you have to also, you have to also take into consideration who the information is coming from. He's never at any point been a fan of our quarterback, but I think for anyone that truly understands how quarterback deprived we've been. Prior to Tua showing up as a gift, I, I believe he, as a gift from God in terms of, unfortunately, he had got hurt. But who he is now and what he's turned into over the last two years, I don't need him to validate what's going on in Miami. And I don't even care if, I don't even care at this point now if anybody else wants to go out there and criticize him. Because if they can't see the work that he's put on the field in terms of going from a guy who they was questioning in regards to him being able to stay healthy to leading the league and one of the top statistical position. I mean, uh, in one of the top statistics to also, you know, what I'm saying getting us back into the playoffs and winning a crucial game that got us into the playoffs. Yeah, we didn't win it, but I, last I last I remember, it's a team sport, and as and it, and you know, and as hurt as we were and as injured as we were down the stretch, all of those things apply because I'm the biggest person in the world. I stand on my soapbox all the time saying that quarterbacks need support around them, and they don't have. Everybody at a hundred, you know, everybody at least ninety percent of who they can be. There's gonna be some issues, and we were depleted up front. So when people, you know, people start to take shots and put that all on him, that tells me two things: one, you never liked him from the beginning; you got a personal issue with him, and two, you just don't care to see who he's become. And that's okay because at the end of the day, we don't really need you. And if you're gonna be, because my my thing is, true fans. If you've been a true fan of this team, you understand how bad it was prior to it's not that situation that we, we're not dealing in that now and there's nothing but promise for for a greater future in front of us we i i, I can't recall the last time and i've been following this, this tunes i've been following this, this team since 77. i can't recall the last time prior to dan after dan retired that i can ever stand in front of anybody and say man i'm a dolphin fan we we, we trending you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. everybody got us in their mouth. So, uh, of course, but um, in the same folk, in the same form and fashion, when they're talking about you, that tells me two things. 
haters are taking they've they've taken their notes and they're watching because they don't want you. They don't want you. They don't want us to thrive. But some things are inevitable. At some point, the Dolphins are gonna win a playoff game and they're gonna win the next one. And then it's a wrap. It's undeniable because this kid's not going to regress anytime soon. So for those people out there that are always willing to jump on the bandwagon with what these fools out here and all these other media platforms are saying, go ahead and do that. But just be man enough and woman enough to come back and and, and humble yourself and say you were wrong when it's all said and done. Don't be standing off in the cut talking crap about us. And then when we do achieve the goal and we do win, then you turn around and you want to act like you've always been here because that's that to me is the fakest crap ever. And ain't nobody got time for that. That's like your homeboy standing next to you saying, Man, I'm a ride or die with you, bro. But as soon as some shit go down, he ain't nowhere to be found. He leaves He's you to your ass handed to you. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like, that's exactly what it is. For that, bro. And yeah. that's what he that's, that's that's what these fans like, man. And, and I'm just sick of it, bro. But um for me, I don't pay attention to any of that anymore. I watch I watch the actions of the player. And there's nothing that Tua has shown me that tells me that he is not at any point taking his his process serious, and that he's he, he he's gonna get better. No, he's not six foot six. No, he doesn't mm. have the biggest arm. How's that working but out what for he has between Lawrence? here? Exactly, <laughs> what he has between these two between his two ears, you can't. That's God given, and yeah. I can I, and I get, I challenge anyone right now to find any quarterback in the NFL right now that's starting for any team that's better at what he does than him. And it yeah. fits what we want him to do in our scheme. So people are hating on it. It is what it is, bro. It's just crazy to me. You know, and at the yeah. end of the day, I'm going to say it. Hope we don't get demonetized, but fuck them. Because I'm yeah. so sick of it, man. I'm really, I really am, bro. You got I'm good back timing. now, though. So, you, got yeah. good t- you, got, you got good timing because we're going to get into this de- defensive stuff, too. Shout out to Garn79. Okay. said my birthday's today. Woo Woo 52. Born in 72. Yeah. And proud to be happy an birthday. Man. So happy birthday. I turned 52 on, on March 14th, so we right there together. What, uh, what is his name? Uh, Garn79. Garn, hey, Garn man. 79. Hey, happy birthday, boss. I got you by a, I got you by a month, though, So but we good. <laughs> so the Dolphins... He, they are meeting with Austin Booker out of Kansas next week. That is a top 30 pick. Um, Add him to the list, a potential day two pick. Edge rusher out of Kansas. Um, Where do I have him ranked on mine? I have him. He, I already dropped my edge board and I don't even remember where I had him ranked. Um, I know I had him in my top 15. I think I had him at, I want to say 10 or 11 if I go back and, um, do, 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 where is it? Okay, so I got him here. I had him 11, you know, just under 6'4 and a half, 240. Um, now he's not like a ridiculous athlete, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, he's got great bend to his frame, knows how to use his arm length with swim moves, can get off, you know, can get off of blocks consistently, which, Obviously, you like to see that. Convert speed to power well. He's a pretty good tackler in open space. You can align him in multiple fronts across the defense. Um, the problem with him is he lacks experience, um, but his ceiling is pretty high from what I've seen. He's going to need that play strength to be strong at the point of attack. And, you know, he has a good initial pass rush game plan, but he's he doesn't have a good array of counter moves and you know he he does, he's not really good at setting you up like it, you can stall him out pretty quickly if that initial whether it be a punch or whatever it is he doesn't work or doesn't land he's pretty easy to stall out so he, you know he's a day two pick um but you know this speaks to it like i i got to say something about this i got to say all that to say this cuz i've seen and i'm going to talk about it on twitter tomorrow but i've seen people oh you know, how can you take an edge or receiver at 21 when, you know, we got all these other needs? Listen, I'm going to say this. I say it all the time. You never draft for needs in the first. That <coughs> reaching is what will get you fired. Reaching is what will get you in trouble. At 21, you need someone, yep. especially with the amount of quarterbacks and such that are going to go, you need someone who is going to contribute with the holes we have. So when you talk about Chris Greer – Edge is a premium position. Wide receiver is a premium position. Right. Tackle is a premium position. Quarterback's a premium, but we're not going to draft one at 21. Cornerback is a premium position. 
right? So, I mean, defensive tackle starting to turn into a premium position given the freaking market, but you see where I'm going with this. That's why when people are like, oh, if Jackson right. Powers Johnson's on the board at 21, but yeah, if you got one of your top three edge rushers on the board, if Jared Verse is on the board, you take Jared Verse. You do not take, take Jackson Powers Johnson or Graham Barton. You just, that's right. not how you draft. So I say all that to say that, you know, go ahead, Bogham. You want to say something? Yeah, I think I think oh, when people, people I think people get more I think people get more tied up with the names than the needs. And the first yeah. round is all about filling the most immediate need because can't nobody deny it really that we do need a third receiver. Right? They went out and took they you know, went out and got John Hu to work the tight ends position, but you know, um you still need a third receiver. Somebody other than Bra- Braxton Barrio, so you don't know what was going on with Eric Ezokama. So you need that space field to, to complete the the triplet for a tour. You know what I mean? And if you if you re- they did it, I think they did an awesome job so far of filling um or bringing in guys for the offensive line that that can compete, guys that they know without a shadow of a doubt they can trust, guys that are willing to learn, guys that are willing to um compete to get better and compete to stay healthy so that they can actually help to stay healthy and help to thrive. So I think they did, they did the due diligence on that. You know, most of the names aren't sexy, but you don't need sexy. You need serviceable and you need highly serviceable. And they did that. I think I, I commend Greer for that. I think he did an amazing job of doing that, but your key pieces, like you said, the guys that they picked that, that 21st pick has to be a kid that can come in right away and contribute from day one. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, Projects happen in the third and fourth round. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That first pick and that second pick need to be kids that you're going to get some productivity for them from day one, and they're going to be pushing other guys for starting roles on the team. Otherwise, you missed, and um, I don't think at any point it's going to be um, what looks good to me over what I need the most. And that's a smart way to go because this team is talented, but they have some key needs to make them even more talented. And I, I, I like that they're keeping, you know, a lot of their options close to the best. I mean, 21, they, there's a lot of flexibility there. And I think a lot of teams are going to rush and go up and grab quarterbacks early, which is going to push some kids even closer down the line. I don't really want to be – I wouldn't want to be Chris Greer because I think there's going to be some really nice talent that falls there. And you get tempted at times. But I think he's been – really smart about sticking to his game plan and sticking to what the team needs more so than what they might want, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm going to trust that. So, well, it's like, you know, one of the things that was brought up in the chat yesterday was like, well, you know, and, and I've seen brought up on other platforms, you know, well, you know, they've got a rotation to fill in for Christian Wilkins. They should, mm-hmm. you know, DT might be off the board at 21. And I say to that, <laughs> Johnny Newton, Jerzan Newton is probably the best one for one off for Christian Wilkins in this draft with a higher pass rush upside. Are you really going to stop, let a rotation of good and mediocre players stop you from drafting a potentially great player? Again, that's how you get fired. That's not, that's not how you draft. You do not let one of the, one of the biggest rules I tell everyone all the time, never let good players prevent you from drafting great players. It's that simple. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? So your thoughts on um the the you know any of that, Richmond? No, I, I mean I think both of y'all hit it hit it right on the head. Um um uh, you need is not what you do or in the first round. You know, you want guys to come in and, and be able to contribute. You know, those are typically your high round picks, but and, and the thing with that, a lot of times, the reason a lot of guys get lost is because they can't get the guy signed or the contract negotiated, and you miss a lot of time. And by the time you come in, your rookie season's lost. But it doesn't mean you don't have the ability. But I think teams now are starting to figure out with the way the, the um, first round is kind of slotted and this and that. I think it makes it easier for teams to kind of go ahead and get that player signed get them in camp, get them start working and get them acclimated to the system and start working at them. And then once you play, the speed of the game will come because now you're just reacting instead of just, what do I do on this play that you're not thinking you react and do that. Then the, the process normally speeds up a lot more. So no, I agree with both of y'all, both of y'all brought up great points. So yeah, I'm, I'm on board with you too. 
Um, Dolphins Realtor, what if Newton is on the table and somebody, hey, listen, I, I'll be consistent. Same thing for Bo Nix and Michael Penix. If they're on the board and someone's willing to give a King's Ransom, take it and move back because we need take picks. It. But how far are you moving <laughs> back, right? Yeah. So, like, because, you know, the first four are going to be gone probably in the top 10 in terms of um, Caleb Williams, Drake May, uh, Jaden Daniels, and Drake JJ Drake. McCarthy. And then, yeah. you know, for me, if someone's willing to move up for Bo Nix or Michael Penix and they're willing you can make them pay for it, yeah, you take it and you move back. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I would do at least. Because especially if, I'll be honest with you, if you put a gun to my head and said, Reason, what do you want at 21? I want one of those top four offensive tackles to drop. That's what I want. I want one of those four top four offensive tackles to drop that I can slide into guard in year one and it can kick back out when Armstead leaves in year two. I think that would be the most brilliant thing, right? And But that gun to my head, that's my preference. So if one of those guys isn't, you know, if foshnu has gone, Alt's gone, fuaga has gone, JC Latham's gone, then yeah, then I'm, I'm, then I'm open, open for business. But listen, if the phones aren't ringing, and the, the real question is if the phones aren't ringing and Jerzan Newton and Leatu Latu are on the board at 21, then right. and Brian Thomas, what do you do? Because that's that's the real one. I don't think Latu may I refuse to believe Latu makes it to 21. He's just so polished and such a technician. I just refuse to believe it. And speaking of edge, I don't know if you guys saw it. I know ball, maybe this is news for ball game because he was out on the on the uh on the track, but Carl Lawson visited the Dolphins today, per league source, telling Aaron Wilson. And everyone oh, wow. knows what Carl Lawson has done. You know, Carl Lawson, you know, seven sacks in 2022 20, with the Jets, five and a half the year before with the Bengals. Um, you know, a decent, a decent edge option. Now, he's not exactly the best at setting the edge and against the run. But when you talk about pass rush, you know, you're talking about a guy who, um, you know, last on 2022 on 432 pass rush snaps generated 49 pressures. And in 2020, um, because he didn't play in 2021, in 2020 on 437 pass rush snaps, he generated 64 pressures with the Cincinnati Bengals. So Cincinnati what are your thoughts? Bengals ball game on on him because you know what i see it as what we were just talking about they want us chris greer is doing a masterful job of free agency he's trying to set us up for bpa as much as possible like that is what this man is doing right yeah. now well because carl lawson yeah. ain't going to stop you from taking one of those top edges if they fall in your lap so what are your thoughts on potentially Not adding to listen to that rotation I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not opposed to it. I think there's a lot left in his tank. I think that um, you have to be uh, mindful of how you go about grabbing guys and bringing them in in the mix because you still don't know whether or not Phillips and Chubb will be ready. So they can give you a guy like Lawson can give you some quality quality reps and not take away from what you're trying to build in terms of what Weaver wants to do on his defense because. He's savvy enough as a veteran, and he's still young enough to be able to learn some new things if he needs those things added to his toolbox. So, I'm 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 not opposed to it. It just depends on how much he want, how much money he's looking for to make because he's not going to be one of the top guys when those other two guys come back. So, that that part of it, it will be a, um, a question mark in regards to what's his compensation going to be. But I mean, I always liked Lawson. I thought that when he joined the Jets. Um, that was going to be a problem for us because he was legitimately going to move himself into their premier pass rusher, and then he got hurt. And I, mm. I was kind of like, okay, yeah, um, <laughs> all right, thank you, God. Because <laughs> prior to, you know what I mean, even though he only had the five and a half over in Cincinnati the year prior to him leaving, he was still disruptive, man. And a guy like that can cause you problems, and you can move him from one side to the other, and he's fluid, you know. And um, just sometimes, sometimes pressure is more important is more important than the actual sacks themselves because if you can get the quarterback to move off of his spot it's going to throw off of his throw off his timing and then that ball is going to sail on him and go other places and incompletions are just as good as sacks in my opinion because they're one step closer to getting them off the field especially on crucial downs so mm. um a guy that can consistently do that at a high clip 
that's a guy that I'm definitely looking at possibly bringing in. And, you know, I'm glad Greer is out there turning over every rock to see exactly what GM might be under it. So a smart, mm. smart business all around. Mm. Um, Lewis donates four ninety nine. He says, what are your thoughts on drafting FSU wide receiver Johnny Wilson as a tight end or a slot receiver? Obviously, he's mentioning tight end because he's 6'6". 231. He runs a 45240. Um, you know, he shows pretty good explosiveness to his game. He's pretty good, pretty agile for his size. Obviously, his size is prototypical. I just my issues lie in with him, and he does have a decent catch radius. My issues, is he's you know, he doesn't Gosh. have great twitchiness. You know, he doesn't, he's not a good route runner, right? For his size. He's not a good blocker. The physical aspect of the nope. game isn't, you know, a big strength of him, right? So, um, you know, hands are a little suspect. Likes to catch with his body more than his hands. Not a huge – he didn't even make my top 15 wide receivers, and he didn't make my top 15 tight ends options, I believe, either. Um, what are your thoughts on Johnny Wilson? You're an FSU fan, ballgame. I, I I like the fact that Johnny came from um, West Coast program out there um, in Calabasas, and I know his people, I know some of his family and whatnot. But I, for as big as he is and the size he is, he is a bit soft. And moving to the next phase of his career, I mean, even Michael Pittman was more mm. physical at the point. Like I mean, Isaiah and I talked about that. He was on the phone with Mike the other day. Um, I think. When you talk about guys with that type of size, you expect them to be physical specimens in terms of their their willingness to just get in there and just throw guys around and want to blow guys up, and that's just not Johnny man. And he never he never took to that with not with Norvell at FSU, so that concerns me. So when you talk about wanting to move him to tight end, one of the one of the key cogs of being a tight end is your willingness to block in the run game and block sometimes in the passing game if you're not the number one receiving threat and i just don't see that being something that he's ready to do just yet you set you all over again Morgan. Too, you know what i mean and a lot of these guys yeah a lot of these guys want to be prima donnas man i just don't see i wouldn't i don't see johnny ever wanting to be anything other than a wide receiver in the nfl will he pan out to be one of the better ones only time will tell us that because he still has a childish <clears throat> nature to him he's still fairly young and i just don't feel like a team's going to be willing to wait on him to mature and to that body and that frame that God has given him. And that's going to be his downfall unless he mentally decides for himself that I'm going to play big. I'm, I'm going to play up to my frame. So far, he hasn't done that. You know, and, there's, and those drops are a result of inexperience and I just think a lack of commitment to the craft, right? Because mm. when you're that big, you got to have something, either great route running, or being able to high point the ball and separate, you know, catch the ball away from your body where you got all that long wingspan to deal with over the DBs. And that's just not something that he's ever rounded himself or polished in his game. And, you know, we talk about it all the time, uh, my sons and I, how easy it is to defend him because of his lack of those, those key uh, attributes. Now, Keon Coleman, on the other hand, that's a different story. Keon is a guy that, that was willing to put the work in to get better. His footwork got better, catching the ball outside of his frame, going up and high-pointing the ball, willingness to block in the run game. He was completely opposite of Johnny in a lot of things, and he became the number one guy there just off of the fact that he outworked him. So that's a guy that you would want to um, also look at if you was looking to try to bring in a larger receiver, who he reminds me yeah. a lot of Andre uh, Yoshivas that's over there in Cincinnati right now. They, a, a bigger, larger frame, not as big as T. Higgins was, but in the same sense, a guy, a guy that's not as big. Well, he's six three, about two eighteen, two nineteen. You know what I'm saying? But he plays bigger than he plays bigger than Yoshi Voss over there. Oh, in I thought you were talking about Keon with his I thought you were six three, two yeah. thirteen. Is called yeah. Keon, 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 and Yoshi Voss remind me of each other because they're both they both have the same mentality of I'm not gonna let you at five foot eleven or six foot six foot one beat me i know i'm bigger than you i'm going to dominate you on every rep and that's what you need as a big receiver because guys can guys gonna want to move you off your you know what i'm saying they're gonna move you off of your balance points and get into your body a lot faster so you got to be dominant and willing to engage and be physical like to used to be you feel me like larger receivers 
have to work harder. Calvin and all those guys, they worked harder at getting the nuanced things down, like the route running and dropping their hips and being able to come out of their breaks, you know what I'm saying, and mm. getting open with not just the alligator arms but full extension because they weren't worried about the punishment that was coming because they knew that guys had to – the DBs had to factor in hitting you when you're that big. You feel me? Because they was physical. So, yeah, Johnny yeah. Johnny to me is going to be an interesting – yeah, Michael Yeah, Keon's the way. FSU stud, bro. Keon's yeah, the FSU yeah, yeah, stud, sure. bro. Like, sure, I think sure. he's got – I think Keon has got some of the best body control in this class, <laughs> in this wide receiver yeah. class. It's, it's unbelievable. And he's so strong at the catch point, and those hands, it's like I wrote in my scouting report, you know, it seems like they naturally have stick a, stick them coming out of the pores on his hands, right? So, yeah, and he has improved. Where I noticed the big improvement with him is his release package and his ability to get off the line with his hand usage. Yep. And and Keon is, you know, Keon's yep. really worked on that man. So, you know, I think and I think he could, you know, he gives you flexibility. He can be a boundary. He can be a big slot. You know what I mean? You you saw him firsthand. He's sneakily, yep. deceptively a damn good special teams contributor to Keon Coleman. He offers you a lot yeah. as a draft pick, yeah. right? Where I don't yeah, see that with John. I don't see a lot with Johnny Wilson. Shop game. You know? Nah. Yeah. Yeah, Johnny a one-trick pony, man. You, you, yeah. He's a 50-50 guy at best that you're hoping that you're hoping that he'll catch type, type of thing. Yeah, Devontae yeah. Parker all over again, but just a little taller. Yeah. No. Yeah. Shout out to Karen. She <laughs> says it's her birthday today, born in 82. So happy birthday happy to birthday. you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy. Just missed Shout her it. having an eclipse yeah. birthday by a couple days, huh? A so, couple days. A yeah. couple days. Uh, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Ball game. We got, I got to talk to you uh, uh, when we get backstage about a development. So, um, any final thoughts before we get out of here, Richmond? Let's okay. start with you, buddy. Any final thoughts? No, you know, I, I'm glad we had the special guest pop in on us. You know, it's been a few weeks, and uh, so he I'm just glad called you he's a special back. guest. Yeah, yeah, special guest. You know. that, that chair was getting mighty so cold over there. That's that speed race. The chair was getting cold, so I'm glad my brother back. <laughs> this and that. So, um, you know, I won't be here next week with ball game, so you got to hold it down. But yeah, I mean. I, always good, you know. Oh, I love, love you and reason, y'all, my boys. But yeah, glad you back. Happy to get the the great the great report on your kids doing so well and track this and that because I, yeah. I know that gives you a good feeling, you know. You know, other kids. So other than that, that's it. I'm gonna turn it over to ball game. Let him let him shine. He's been shining, so let him shine. Hey, once again, I'm I'm, I'm glad to be back, man. I think it's all it's always. I don't think I know it's always a good time when I'm with y'all, man. It's, it's um. This is home for me. All right, y'all, my brothers, man, and I'm glad y'all supported me through this other venture for this coaching thing and was just patient with me. Um, I like people, man. I want people to just be patient, bro. Like, Rome was not built in a day, and we went through so many years of just heartache and heartbreak, but this there's positivity oozing from this team, man. And no matter how, how last year ended, in place that's going to help this team be that much better um, in their pursuit of a championship. And you just got to believe, you know, I know that the years of, the, you know what I'm saying, getting, almost getting there and not getting there type of thing takes a lot out of you. But, you know, that's the that's the best part about being a fan. You can, you get a, you get the reset, hit the button, and all of the, the build up towards something great. And if you don't reach it, you know what I'm saying, you get to go back in the off season along with the team and reset the button and reset the bar. And then you get to go at it again. And every year for this team, this team in particular, moving forward, the bar is getting that much further and higher. And I think they're going to achieve it. I know what I shout out that they want to, because they want to shut the naysayers up just as much as we want them to shut them up. So um, it's a mindset. They've got a different mindset about how they're going to go about achieving greatness. And we also, as fans, have to change our mindset. No longer are we the team that, you know, then you got to you, you gotta go out there and hope that you're going to win. There's games that we know we have an ability. Every game we have the ability to go in and win, and execution is going to be our best friend because they're breathing it. They're eating, sleeping, and breathing execution. And I think Mike has instilled that in them, in them that, you know, I can call it a perfect play, but without you guys going out and perfectly executing it, who knows that it's a perfect play. And they want to they wanna make him look good. He wants them to look good. And they damn sure want to reward Mr. You know, Mr. Ross for all of his efforts and Mr. Greer. So 
Um, embrace the embrace the positivity. Let the negativity roll off your back and keep it moving, man. Y'all start listening to all these clowns out here that's got all these answers about things that they've never done <laughs> and never been a part of. Then you start going down a rabbit hole with them, and then you lose the focus. And if you're a true yeah. Dolphin fan, if you're a true Dolphin fan, you can't afford to lose focus because this is the best time to get dialed in now because we're, yeah. we're, we're pointed in the right direction. So that would be my that would be my thing. Just stay positive and just be grateful that we're in a position we're in because it's a unique one. And, um, yeah, we lost some key players, some guys that we loved and we wish we could have held on to them. But they have to do what's best for them and, and Greer and um, everybody's got to do what's best for the organization. And I think he's doing the best – job he can of filling holes so that this team stays highly competitive and highly motivated to go after their championship. That's it. So. Lemony Crawdad said, hey, Reason, sorry your big boards keep getting demonetized. Thanks for all the hard work. Three of my four big boards I've dropped have been demonetized. So shout out to you, Lemony Crawdad. I'll be back tomorrow at 5 with Neil Driscoll. Until then, you already know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day. We'll see you all in the next one.